Hey, we're recording now. All right. Thank you, Jose. Sure. Um, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Sleep TV. We're doing it a little bit different tonight. So we've got just a couple slides because we know it takes people a few minutes to get in here. But in appreciation of everyone's time, we're going to keep the, the ball rolling here. Uh, now we're live streaming, so that's good as well. We should be on Facebook Live. That always makes Ronnie happy. But due to some last minute changes, I know we had Dan Taché on deck. If you tuned in last week, he was gonna do a presentation, but things happen, so he's been pushed out a little bit. And on the, the seat of our pants, we decided to do an AMA, which many of you right. might think is against medical advice you know that's kind of the standard medical abbreviation but i stole this from a physician that a podcast i listened to peter atia the drive and he does these amas they're paid subscriptions so this is free this sleep tv is always free and i've asked my co-workers to join me tonight i've got rebecca Leahy, director of education and mr john nadeau our chief strategy and innovation officer Hi, my name is Jeff, and if you don't know me, I'm the National Clinical Director for Sleep Group Solutions. And let's see, uh, probably got to unshare my screen for a second, just so I can advance some PowerPoint slides. So uh, talk amongst yourselves, John and Rebecca. I think this is just a great opportunity for everybody and our friends to, to have a few minutes to get to come visit and say hello and ask questions that are, so we can maybe take an opportunity to to cross some barriers that people might be having trouble with. Whoa, I need to get you a new slide deck. I, I know, I just keep using the same one I've had oh, forever. But, uh, well, I'll That's let you guys go first pandemic. since Rebecca's got the mic and then I'll go to John, I'll back <laughs> up and then I'll put myself in there and then we'll get rolling here. Cool. Well, I'm just really happy. I'm, uh, you know, I, I love doing what we do. I, I love uh, traveling around the country and helping teach teams. I try to lead sleep group and, in uh, our education system so that we can really help dentists and their teams uh, be successful with this really exciting protocol for, for uh, ways to help patients with airway care. Um, what I always I, brag about you, sister, is huh? what I always brag about you is what? even though you don't have the DDS or the DMD behind your name, you've run two successful sleep practices. Yeah. You, you've mm -hmm. taught thousands of dentists to do this. And so I couldn't think of a better friend to have on tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm always learning and always trying to learn and always trying to share, you know, real freely and openly share the goods and bads. And, you know, when I first started this, John, uh, you know, I, I met John years and years ago. I think it's eight years now. It is eight years now. And, uh, uh, he took a chance on and I kept bugging him about, you know, let me help people. Let, I really want to come help teach. I really want to do this. And he really gave me a chance to, to get my wheels in uh, on the ground to, to help other teams. And I, I could be more thankful for him trusting me and giving me a chance. Uh, he's family. And, and John and I have been around you long enough. We know that if we don't butt in, uh, you'll just take over the show and that's okay too. But yeah. uh, John, I just noticed <laughs> I need to update your title because you've uh, recently been promoted. After yeah, that's okay. Something years. That's all right. Um, well, you know, I, I think this is a cool, you know, usually we do these sleep TVs with a, a set topic, but I'm interested to see what people have to say tonight, what kind of questions they have. And honestly, yeah. I think just having our, our full arsenal of slides and info queued up um, based on the questions, we can kind of jump around so we don't even have to cover set topics. We can just, um, you know, we can pull up what's, you know, whatever people are asking about. So that's yeah. going to be interesting. Now, now um, you're testing my skill set. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Just have like a thousand slides on standby and jump to the right one instantly. Uh, but it. no, I'm excited. And, and to that point, if, uh, if people have, you know, if there's something burning that you wanted to get out there, you know, I know we have it shared right now where the the camera's open and all that stuff. But um, even just typing in the chat into Zoom here, you know, put a put a question in the chat and we'll kind of queue them up and, and go through them as, as needed. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. All right. So my name is Jeff. Like I said earlier, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Jeff. Jeff is fine with me. But my story began really in the mid late 90s uh, i've been a dentist for nearly 30 years now 
And people always ask, when did you get started with sleep? And I, you know, the, the definitive answer was 2007. But honestly, I don't think you can practice a day in dentistry without impacting your patient's airway. And I didn't realize it until I was mid-career. And it happened with my youngest daughter, who's up here on the left. She had a functional shift and nothing hotter in our, in our field right now than pediatric airway. But adult sleep apnea is a problem that's present for decades. And it's not until we've survived with it for many years that we see the consequences. So long story of me as I, I retired, 2017, sold my practice. I, I attempted to become a uh, snowmobile guide. So that's me in my backyard. Uh, John, that's, that's one of the sleds that you should be buying right now. And <laughs> my passion has always been to teach. Uh, and those are my two daughters and, and they're my why along with my patients that I've seen over the years, and two in particular that I restored with comprehensive crown and bridge that, uh, unfortunately, their dentistry lasted their lifetime because it was less than a year. And it was because I never asked the question of what's the root cause of their problem. So we'll get into, and can you guys see the scribble marks on the screen or is that just me? Yep, I just don't know how to get rid of them. Yep. I can't see this. I can see the slides, but I can't see if anybody's asking me or, or anybody. Oh, there are some people. I don't know. There's like weird marks on the screen. It's yeah, probably, no, it's like, really it's, it's it's like probably like my chalkboard or something. But uh, yeah. on the page. maybe stop, stop sharing and then start again. Okay, let's try that. Oh, there it is. Nice. Well, look at all these happy faces. Let's see who is all here. Stop the share. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. All right. Ashley. Uh, we've got Kara's in here, and we've got Ashley, and we've got um, Mary, Mary Lou and Chad. Hi, hi everybody. Oh, so we, we've been talking about this for a while, uh, Jose and some others. Hi, Hal. But How are you? This is always kind of the Brady Bunch. You know, everybody needs to do I love things. it. I love it. That's where you are in your tiles. Dr. Walden, but, Dr. Gwen. But we've got um, we've got just a few slides, maybe like five, and then uh, we're going to open it up, uh, let a few more people join into the room, um, and and we'll do that. So I've got a chat here from somebody. What's that say? Excited to see Dr. Davis in the house. So shout out from Carol. Shout out to Dr. Davis. Is that my Iowa guy? Is that Bob? All right, I'm back to sharing screen. So that went away. Uh, what are we screen for in our dental offices right now? So is everybody unmuted? I mean, most of you are probably screening for caries because you're dentist. You're screening for periodontal disease. Although when I used to teach with my friend, Dr. Lau, who was president of American Association of Periodontists, he said that it was an alarming, like 7% of dentists pick up a perio probe on a comprehensive exam. It was ADA statistics. Um, I never fact checked it, but uh, to me, that was alarmingly low. Uh, perhaps someone else in the office was doing it, but I know a lot of patients enter practices through hygiene and I hired some of the best coaches in the industry. And that was the first thing we, we changed. Um, even though practices, received the phone call every day of the patient that wants to schedule their cleaning. Uh, the response was always, well, what type of cleaning would you like? You know, we offer six or we offer nine, whatever it is that you offer. So uh, Rebecca, you do this part so well. Um, I'm gonna let you take this over and then I'll chime in. Sure. Well, you know, we, uh, the things that we screen for you guys uh, are always, you know, basically the same, but now, it's really mandatory, it's really imperative. And the American Dental Association has really um, taken their policy and position to say that it is really our job to begin screening airway. You know, we screen for oral cancer. You've got their tongue in your hand. Um, we've got to look past that molar and, and look into the airway and uh, begin this airway screening process. Um, you know, so many patients that, that come to us children and adults have airway issues. So the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine have really combined forces to lay the brunt of airway care on us because we do work closest to the airway. Who's better for it than us? We're looking at the cause. So, um, you know, the American Dental Association has really stated themselves that for patients 
uh, adults, we need to have a protocol. Um, we need to have a plan of, of action to help these patients not only be screened, but have a way to help them get the care that they need. Uh, we need to be able to help identify signs and symptoms in adults and in children. 99% um, of what we see already is in your health history that you've already got. So we really need to begin to, to draw a, a little straighter line between the health questionnaire that we're giving out to patients and their airway. And, and really begin to look at patients philosophically from the airway forward instead of from the teeth back. How do you think about that, Jeff? Is that, I think that's the way you talk about that as well. Well, for sure. I mean, this has been going on. So 2015 was actually when the ADA first attempted to come up with their position statement. It wasn't published until 2017. Right. It's changed every year over year. And there's a big reform coming for next year, as I've heard the rumblings from the panel of what's being talked about. And they're, they're finally hitting my passion and probably yours as well, Rebecca, is we need to start looking much earlier in life yeah, than peace. what most people are taught when they go to a weekend course in sleep medicine. Absolutely. This, this begins before we're born or can begin before we're born. And it just compounds over time. And well, I always try to say, my way of saying is that, you know, you're born with the tube that you have. You're either born with an airway tube that's nice and firm and has enough integrity to keep itself open, um, like a garden hose, or you're born with an airway that doesn't, that's squishy, that's collapsible, because it's a disease of collapsibility, like a fireman's hose. Um, and, and you're born with that. That's not something that you develop. That's a genetic anomaly in your in your in your constitution so we need to what i did uh i did it last minute because yeah you know probably the friends of ours that are on here all know this information i hope we're not boring them to tears so by a quarter after i no, promise you in. it's going to be yeah ama uh but we've got people on here too that this is brand new and they're 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 most of them are probably stuck because yeah. uh, many people will come to a course either ours or someone else's and they don't ever take action. And I never understood it. Like, it, and John says it the best, like once you know it, you're gonna see it everywhere. So John, if you're around, yeah, uh, can you comment? No, I, I <laughs> yes. Once you know it, you, you can't unsee it. But, you know, we're talking about screening and why it's all it's so important to screen and, and why the ADA says everybody should screen. And so everybody's talking about screening, 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 but there's a, there's a process to follow there. And, and, you know, Jeff, you said people get stuck and I think they get stuck on that. You know, what's your goal of screening? If you're going to screen a patient, you know, conservatively one in four of your adult patients has this, right? Has some degree of undiagnosed, untreated sleep disordered breathing. So it's not, we're not talking about one in a million. Everybody tomorrow is going to see one before lunch. That's, you know, everybody on this call. So, the question now is now, now what, all right? So if you do a good job and you screen, you identify, you look at their airway, you talk to them, you do screening forms and papers and questionnaires and health history updates, what's your goal, right? Now, What's your goal? Is your goal to sell them little pretty oral appliances, right? If it is, you know what? You're never gonna make one of these because if you're screening, 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 and then going straight to treatment, which is what I, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and, and I've been in a few hundreds and thousands of offices, and I could tell you that that's probably the biggest mistake people make is they, they go to treatment too early. This as, as needs to be an education journey for your patients. You know, here's what happens. You screen, 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 or your hygienist screens, right? And your, your hygienist finds all the check. Oh, God, this person's overweight. They snore. They have high blood pressure, acid reflux, morning headaches. It's like, oh, they got everything. Okay. You know, Mr. Patient, we can make you an appliance to fix that. Here, let's talk to the doctor about it. Now, doctor comes in. We start talking about appliances. Guess what you're going to talk about next? How much it costs? Insurance. Yay. That's what we want to do on a screening, right? On top hey, of hey, a hey, hygiene hey, appointment hey, that's hey. now 30 minutes too long. Can I just say guilty? <laughs> right so so that's you know that's we got to understand the process this is even though you know about sleep disordered breathing let's assume your patient doesn't have a clue 
And even though you know this could be as deadly as cancer, they don't. And so when we're screening and talking to them about treatment, we got to first circle back to diagnosis. And if your goal for screening is to get people in for a consult and have a conversation with them, not about fixing their problem, but about figuring out what their problem is, and you educate them through this journey, now when you talk about appliances, they're ready to talk about appliances. Now, when you talk about appliances, their, their motivating factor is not, well, how much is it and who's paying for it? It's, oh my gosh, I need one of those or I'm going to die. Right. But you got to wait. You got you to nurture that process. And, and the, what I've noticed over the years is the offices that figure that out are the ones that don't call us every week and say, oh my gosh, what about Medicare? And what about insurance? And what about this? And what about that? It's not about who's buying. You know, and, and if you can make that your process, then insurance becomes a, a, a nice perk, but not a requirement, right? And, Absolutely. you know, I think that's probably my biggest little soapbox thing I could, I could say on that. Well, you know, and that's kind of why we set up the protocol the way we did. So right. the protocol that we've set up, the only time I see teams, when I, when I have a team reach out to me to say, hey, Rebecca, please come help us because we are not getting anything done. When I go to the office and we sit down and we start to talk about their pathway to patient care, they're, they're trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, sleep group's taken a really good, a long time to develop this protocol that works, but it works for a reason because it takes the steps through the education process and the diagnostic process to get these patients taken care of. So that by the time we loop around to have that discussion, the discussion is about living longer, not about, is my insurance going to pay for it? So that- I was bored one day. Uh, John, John will hate to hear this, but I, I was bored one day. So I added up the years of experience in dental sleep medicine of all the people that speak for us. And so we, we've got a large fleet of people that are wet finger every day practicing this. This is, this is what they do. They don't work for us. And it was nearly 400 years of experience. It, 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 that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And We've so, like, even two, looking so. at the small spattering of people we have tonight, like if you just added up the experience in this forum, it, it's it's versatile. So, uh, we wanted to do this more open tonight instead of just someone talking and presenting. Uh, the the challenge that you always do there is maybe someone's not going to ask a question, and so I'm gonna. Open it up to whoever wants to ask a question. Just unmute your mic and, and fire away. This is yeah, asking anything. Who has a question about screening or in the protocol? Does anybody is anybody having trouble with um, either getting your hygienists on board and your other team on board to to begin the screening process or following the protocol through? Anybody have any questions about how we can do that better? And if no one speaks up, I'll I'll call you out by name. And Mary Lou's smiling, so guess what? <laughs> say hello, say where you're from. Camera's on, so she, yeah. Yeah, Mary Lou's the only brave one. To I, put I know she's listening, so. Okay. So tell us your name, tell us where you're from. You're on mute. Hi, I did it earlier, too. Space okay. bar is how you unmute real fast. Unless you're Got on it. Phone. Got it. Um, you also probably caught me drinking wine. So. <laughs> Oh, but, I love it. That's you are my people. I cheers you, but John will fire me. <laughs> um, I I am a hygienist right now. I am uh, not working because I'm I'm taking care of my brother who is a stroke victim. Um, but I have found in in all of this a new passion. I see this everywhere I turn I turn on TV and I see the telltale signs I see kids walking down the street I'm talking to dentists till I'm blue in the face I'm so, I am frustrated. so frustrated where do you live I live in El Paso Texas amazing and I believe there are like four dentists here in town that are doing this. I'm not sure. I think that they're with sleep group, not too positive. Um, the other dentist, you know, I keep talking to them about, you know, this is so critical. 
they're so afraid of the insurance uh, type of thing. They're so afraid of being reimbursed. One of, uh, uh, that, that's a wonderful. good fear to have. I mean, I, I wish I was afraid of being reimbursed. I just wish I was always reimbursed. But <laughs> one one dentist, he is he's an orthodontic dentist. He's been working with this type of thing all the time. He diagnosed my stepson when the orthodontist didn't catch it. No other d dentist caught it, and did expansion palate expansion when he was twenty one. You know, saw that he had a broken septum his it, his maxilla was collapsed he actually kind of looked like a pro magnon because this this part was pronounced this part had grown and the maxilla hadn't had never been able to breathe and after he had his surgery and his tonsils removed bloody nose and all he was saying mm, i can breathe and then, you know, we started on, on the palate expansion. Um, no one had caught that. And, you know, and I was just, this, this is amazing. Yeah, I always, and, you know, maxillary deficiency, in my opinion, is the root cause here. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter that I put up earlier, when she was six, we did palatal expansion but we also did frenum release. So we have to think of this. I, right. I used to say in 3D, you know, there's transverse, there's AP, and then there's vertical, but really modern day dentists are thinking of this in six dimensions because there's also pitch, yaw, and roll. Uh -huh. you know, so it's like a gyroscope out there. And at 21, it's not an easy thing to correct um, non-surgical. So orthodontic well, thing perhaps, but back to Rebecca's point earlier is, even if we have structural statistical norms or you know, what is supported through anthropology and study of skulls, mm -hmm. you could still have a very collapsible airway. I'm the prime yes. example. So cone yeah. beam, like this, I fight this every week, it seems like. Someone says, well, I bought, I'm gonna buy a cone beam so I can look at the airway. I'm like, great, you'll capture the worst of the worst. Because if you took a, a cone beam on me, my airway is you know, six, seven square centimeters but I can collapse it down to like 1.2 if I don't have airflow. Hmm. But I also had tonsils out when I was five. You know, I was, I was in the early stage of that And you can't that see curve. that collapse on a, on a cone beam. Yeah. Nope. You, yeah. you, can. you can't see that collapse. You know, I think so it's, it's coming. It's, I think someone we... will superimpose the data of, of an echo vision collapse because it's a, it, you know, it's a line sure. program. And, and then if sure. you have the anatomize, but, program type yeah. picture it's it's pretty people get it but to see it in live yeah. action is when everybody's eyes go yeah. <laughs> you know what the comb beam is to me the comb beam is to me um my profile picture today that was a picture that was done a long time ago it doesn't really look like me it doesn't have any i expanded i changed and <laughs> it's a static picture i'm not going to look like that that's what a comb beam is it's a two-year-old picture of my face without any goodness it just well, i'm shrinking so we got to talk rebecca <laughs> huh i'm shrinking so we got to talk oh i'm not i'm not doing that i'm good you tried it you didn't like it i got it uh, i just can't carry it well I, I, thanks mary lou thanks thanks for speaking up we appreciate it um good luck to your it was a brother that you're caring for with stroke and we know the incidence of stroke in osa oh really he high. definitely definitely has it definitely yeah. Has his, has his doctor um, done a sleep study for him? Oh, we tried. It was, it, yeah, we tried. It was absolutely horrible because dementia is in there also. Yeah. And yeah. so we have his bed elevated, um, you know, but he, he, I feel, I feel like John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, because everywhere I go, I, I'm, I'm telling the dentist about this. I'm telling other patients, people about this. I'm talking about the arrhythmias that can be solved. I'm talking to our cardiologist friends, and they all have deer in the head like looks. And I, I'm just so... Every course I can get, I am just passionate about this and trying to get the word out. So basically, 
I'm, I'm so glad that you all are educating me. You know, today I ran across someone who had a molar just slightly adjusted and now his tongue, he said, I, my tongue feels too big. Oh yes. And the dentist caught a little area on the dorsal side of his tongue. And the oral surgeon said, ah, it's nothing. It's just you're pressing against that, the other teeth. Well, now he feels everything. And he feels that his tongue is so big. He had too big. He has sleep apnea. Will not even use a mandibular night guard. Broken all of his teeth. Um, you know, just... It's my husband, actually. <laughs> and I just want to slap him. Um, and the oral surgeon told him he needed to get a mandibular night guard. And I said, mm, not until you see one of the dentists who deal with sleep apnea, with obstructive sleep disorder. And it's the, the amount of... Uh, resistance. I guess it's resistance to change. And this is the thing that I'm encountering with dentists also. They're so busy expanding their practice and making the perfect crowns. And they're, they're just not seeing the big picture of saving lives. So typically, my response when I run into that is, we were all trained to be tooth mechanics. Yeah, mm -hmm. in, in dental school, that's what we're prepared for. They have four years to do it. They do a decent job of it. Most of us still have to pass the board, although that's changed quite a bit since I came out. But, you know, probably for the bulk of my career, I've always referred to myself as a, a physician of the mouth and mm -hmm. oral health care provider. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a baseball family uh, and you can't be the pitcher and the catcher. You know, someone's got to throw it, someone's got to catch it. And, and that's dental sleep medicine to me. You know, the dentist is a player on a team. We can't make the diagnosis. So we have to have a board certified sleep physician for that. And oftentimes we need the primary care to sign the prescription or the orders for us to, to do the treatment. And, and those are all the pieces of the puzzle that we need to get paid by the, the patient's benefit plan or medical insurance. Right. And if there's one wheel on the bus that's loose, you know, the wheel comes off. Uh, recently, I was interviewing my friend, Dr. Kent Smith in Dallas, Texas, since you're in Texas. And he said, his why is really to prevent sleepy drivers. And I don't know if you've been to our seminar or not. If not, you know, come and I'll buy you lunch because you'll be the best thing I could have in the room sitting back there. But it's, it's alarming every time that I present those slides of like John's family was on one of the buses that we show. And yeah. so maybe like, I want to hear that story. Let's, let's hear that unless someone else has a question. I don't see anybody else unmuting. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the sleepy driver thing is, is huge. And that's, uh, uh, I mean, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that. So everyone has a different why, like you said, but, um, you know, drowsy driving is, is legit. Sleep apnea is a dominant cause of excessive daytime sleepiness. That's one of our screening criteria. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I had a, a family member that was traveling back from a ski trip in Colorado and, and they, the, uh, you know, the bus they were on uh, crashed and, and ultimately uh, I think eight or nine people died in that accident, but they, they attributed the, the reason for the crash to the driver's excessive sleepiness and he had severe sleep apnea. Uh, and numerous other times, year, I mean, every time there's been one of those major train derailments and crashes, no doubt soon after the, there's a NTSB report that comes out and said, oh, the, the, you know, the train operator was fatigued and he was sleepy and that's why the, the train crashed. And over and over and over, you see those, those stories and it's, it's just, it's wild. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Mary Lou, you said something that struck me too, where, you know, you talked about everyone's afraid to do it. You know, everyone's kind of caught up in their dental practice and they're, they're afraid and they're afraid and, and you know, 
the challenge with that is you're already in it. Nobody gets to choose. No, no, not a single person on this call, if you're in dentistry, gets to choose if you're going to see a sleep apnea patient or not. So like, that's not a, that's not an option. You know, we, we no longer can, can just sit back and say, I'm going to choose to ignore that. That's, that's, that's like saying, I'm going to choose next week. I'm, I'm not going to see any perio, no matter what. We're just, we're going to do a no perio practice. I'm sorry, but you're going to see some, a whole bunch of it. And yeah. the same thing with sleep problems and airway problems. They're there and they're going to be there for you the next day and the day after and the day after and the day after. So really it's, it's, you know, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to keep kind of the, the dental blinders on and, and just kind of look past that or, you know what, maybe there is a process and, and you don't have to be afraid of the insurance stuff. Cause that's what I hear all the time. Oh, I, I'd, I'd love to do that, but I'm just, I'm worried about, you know, billing medical. I'm scared of Medicare. It's not that bad. It's not that scary. There's a process. Don't, you know, that's the end of the process, but don't worry about that. There's a, there's systems in place to help you there. Oh, I'm worried about side effects. I, hear, I, I love when people say that Oh, if I, if I reposition them there, their bite might change. Yeah, but if you don't reposition them, they might die. So, you know, pros and cons. Yeah, um, I, I always yeah, come back. I, I come well, so, back with, will you feel best? Will you feel worse if their bite changes, a tooth moves, a contact opens, or they don't show for their appointment? And when you call them, the answer on the other side of the phone says they're no longer with us. Yeah, and then you just exactly. stop. Just, and so, told, like, whoever's got another question, just go ahead and unmute, and then, like, yeah, once yeah, I just see that, we can shut up. And you, you know, know I always just tell, I tell Dennis that you have, uh, that we kind of have three choices. You know, we can stay status quo, do your thing, do your dentistry. Um, you can ignore, ignore it. Everybody else ignores it. Why wouldn't we ignore it? <laughs> um, you could well, that's opportunity to me. Like, you I can always wanted to be first. Patients. Yeah, so you can stay status quo, which is try hard. You'll have to try hard to do that. You can screen your patients and send them someplace else and pray to God you get them back. Or you can just take care of them yourself with a little help from a team that will help you guide through this. So there is, it's not hard to do. You're already doing 99% of it. It's just a matter of having the steps put in place and knowing what to say. And we're here to help you with that. The other message too is, you know, we the easiest place to implement this is in a new patient experience. And so <laughs> if the new patient's entering a practice outside of hygiene and they come to the practice for the first time in their life, they have no concept of what the experience should be like. That's the opportunity to make your experience stand out from any other dental visit they've ever had. And when you bill it and it says comprehensive exam, I want them to say that was the most thorough evaluation of my life in the dental office. And if they like it, they'll stay with you forever. If they don't, they're going to go find somebody else and you just eliminated a bunch of headaches out of your practice. But the ones that are there that you end up helping have more gratitude and you know more value in the care that you provide and the message is we start with airway because it's the umbrella of all our care so whether you choose cosmetics whether it's you've worn your teeth down and it's a pair of functional habit or whatever yeah, whether it's structural and biological problems you know we can fix that all day long but if we don't address the umbrella that is kind of driving the longevity of all this care we're really protecting your investment by looking at what's happening when you're unaware because we're all unaware when we're sleeping like how many people have you asked do you snore and they're like i don't know i'm asleep but then we ask the bed partner questionnaire which is my favorite one and because they'll throw each other under the bus all day long and no better strategy than yeah, like these presentations <laughs> to have both uh, people in the room I, you're laughing somebody's laughing me, Mary Lou. <laughs> um, is that your brother? Yeah, that's my brother. Oh. His name is Gary. Hi, Gary. Welcome. Thank you. You're very <laughs> welcome. Glad to see you. 
All right, here comes Kathy. Kathy's signing in. Um, hey, Kathy. She's got a camera on. She's unmuted. She's got a question. Hey, yeah, she's over here hiding in her email. Well, actually, I don't have a question. Tell I'm everybody who you are and where you're at, Kathy. So, well, welcome to my office at Pierce College. I'm a professor of dental hygiene in Washington oh, State. And, um, and I just came up from my head and neck anatomy class. Um, but it's like, so I've had the opportunity. So I'm trained, I'm certified in myofunctional therapy and have done the extra coursework for dental hygiene in the sleep medicine realm. And so I'm working really hard to prepare students that talk your language and, um, and the number of times that we get into conversations. So I'm talking about, you know, nasal space. And so I have the perfect field for just infusing all of this conversation and the number of students to just then immediately start. But my sister and her baby won't nurse and my dad snores and the whole house is awake and students who've had the soft tissue, you know, lists and um, modifications in the soft palate and now they're snoring again. Um, so we're just really hoping that everybody keeps expanding, keeps bringing this in, because I'm working really hard to produce dental hygienists that can work with you and are ready to go and already have a broader viewpoint of what all this exam is. So, you know, please go, 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 because we can't go back. And I feel like the genie's out of the bottle, you know, for me. Um, and you can't go back. You can't not see what you see. And the other thing I think has been the most fascinating is I've actually been looking back at pictures I used to teach 30 years ago when I first started. And everybody that said, ah, you always saw the back wall of the oral pharynx. You always saw the uvula. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't even know what Malapati was because everybody was zero and nobody is anymore. And, and the percentage, you know, and we're looking at, you know, 10, 20 patients a day in a big clinic and we don't see the back wall of the soft tissue. And so it's so obvious to us. Um, but like I said, I just, I can talk about this all night. I'm like uber excited, but I'm, like I say, I'm working hard to get hygienists ready to just jump on and go. So please okay. have places and jobs for them. <laughs> you know, Kathy, we're here to support you in your, and in, in your endeavors too. If you ever need us to come visit and, and uh, do a little talk for you, we're happy to do that for you as oh, well. There's some conversations I'd love to have. So however, you know, I follow up. Absolutely, with absolutely. So Kathy, I, I went back to share my screen because okay. I'll be your best contact. So I'm Dr. Harrison. You can just call me Dr. Jeff or Jeff. You'll hear from but, me. <laughs> uh, how many hygienists are you putting out of that program? Um, 20, we have 20 a year. And, 20 a year. Um, and the Pacific Northwest, honestly, is kind of a hotbed for aerocentric yeah. dentists. Yeah, like we have mm -hmm. Steve and we have all the groups out of Seattle and the Coast. Oh, yeah, we, so, we so shoot lucky. me a text message. Here's my okay. personal cell, 719-648-9982. Take a picture of it or my email. And so you can I can definitely too, connect with you tomorrow and or whenever you have a time. I'll put up my calendar in an email. You can see when I'm available. Okay. And I can definitely get those students into some quality practices for you. Happy to do that. Thank That's you. That's awesome. Thanks for the platform. Yeah, getting great hygienists out into, into airway centric dentist, dental practices. What a gift. What a great way to, to combine forces. Or better yet, let's put them into practices that aren't and then let's convert them. Let's make right. more. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And Kathy, I'm, uh, you know, I'd be happy to come and, and lecture for your for your teens, your your students as well. If you uh, if you'd like somebody to come lecture and, and do a course for them uh, from our side of the chair. Awesome, that would be sweet. Yeah, you know, I can find Rebecca's contact here. There she goes. Voila. Um, you, anybody else have any questions? How how about any? Um, you know, as we get through the screening process, the handoff process, sometimes um, sometimes we have a hard time transferring patients and getting patients to return back for that follow-up initial visit where they come and really have a transition from hygiene into our into our actual sleep program. Anybody having difficulties with that that we could touch on? We got a chat question and uh, it's what can be done for the oversized epiglottis. So let's talk about what's the cause of the oversized epiglottis to begin with. Like you're not born with an oversized epiglottis. Glottis or epiglottis? Epiglottis or, or, or probably uvula. Uvula. probably uvula. uvula. Yeah, that's from snoring. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's how I read it. I, I was reading it as uvula. 
Yeah. And then the next comment was, oops, bad spelling, but I don't want to call them out. <laughs> That's it's like, I don't know how you get an oversized epiglottis, but I'm. Uh, but, you know, I learned this from you, Rebecca, and I, I use it ever since I learned it. But open your mouth. I'm going to see your tush. Yep. Let me see if so I can see your tush. Line up for him. Yeah, sure. Tush. So that's what Dr. Malin Plotty would say. Let me open your mouth and let me see if I can see your tongue, uvula, hard palate, soft palate. T U S H is an acronym. Um, if I can, can't can see all four, if I can see all four of them, your airway's generally stable. That that would be, I have a clear picture of the posterior wall. I can see your entire uvula, your soft palate, your hard palate, the base of your tongue doesn't obstruct your uvula. If I can see all those things, we've got a really good picture of the airway. But the more we snore and the more the airway becomes collapsible, the more compliant, we start to see that soft palate sag down into the airway and that drops that uvula and it begins to really vibrate and that elongates the uvula. Poor old Michael, my son's uvula was just, it was probably three, three and a half, four inches long by the time we actually got him treated because it had elongated. It was so irrigated and so irritated from that really loud snoring, really indurates that tissue. So, um, yeah, got to screen for those. And really, the one of the first things we got to do for patients who have that um, really inflamed tissue is to get the snoring stopped, get the mouth closed, and, and help a patient reestablish through nasal breathing. As long as we're making our mouth do our nose's job, as long as we're pushing air past those tonsils and uvula, those soft tissues, they're going to continue to stay irritated. They're going to continue to stay inflamed because we're making them do the job that our nose is supposed to do. So we've got to really work on getting a patient to close your mouth, breathe through your nose. Um, that's, you know, that's one of the importance of rhinometry. Let's make sure that the patient has enough structure and stability and open air to be able to actually breathe through the nose. And then let's work on that system. Myofunctional therapy is part of that. Um, but also to get that patient close for breathing. Maybe that was my internet. You froze for a second, but maybe that was my internet. But yeah, I, I was hoping you would go down that road. Um, 90% of what we do is going to be in the mouth, but if you never look in the nose and we have myofunctional therapist in here and we know nasal breathing is the source for nitric oxide production, don't tell anybody to tape their mouth shut if you've not evaluated the nose. Please. It's okay. dangerous. Yeah. Uh, it needs to be done. And the other topic that I was thinking there was also like with the book Breath or Breathe on the Market by James Nestor, there's more and more patients that are aware of these techniques and philosophies and theories. So they're they're experimenting and they're going to be presenting into offices. Like there's probably not a week goes by that we don't have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I had another thought. It's it's lost my brain right now. That's the problem with getting older, I guess. But um, it'll come back to me in a bit. Let's open for a few more questions. We've got maybe five more, then we'll wrap it up with some closing yeah. slides and we'll all get off to our evening here. I know uh, we do these every Tuesday. Jose has put the link up for next week with Dan Teche. Uh, that's what was originally slotted in for tonight. So hopefully if you guys like this forum, uh, comment on the chat window and say like hashtag value uh, or if you're watching it, Facebook Live, hashtag value. Uh, if, Jose, if you see any questions on Facebook Live, because I'm not on that one, uh, just feed them in to us. Um, but the the make good on that last question was no, it was actually epiglottis. A friend in Costa Rica asked me this, and I have to admit, I had to look it up. Perhaps she meant uvula because she snores. So uh, it, it's the vacuum that's created. You know, it it causes a couple of things. It causes soft tissue elongation, uh, and then oftentimes acid reflux from the GI system. So it first leads to Barrett's esophagus, and then later on, you know, perhaps oropharyngeal cancer, but also ulcerations of if tonsils are present. Uh, you know, we see tonsillar stones in some of these cases. Chronic halitosis is another one. The white coating on the surface of the tongue. Uh, I know I, I open my mouth when I'm obstructed to, to get air. 
your brain figures it out. If you are someone that's a flippy floppy fish and you can't find the perfect space to, uh, to sleep in, it's often correlated when we look at that sleep study that you desaturated and so your brain woke you up and you changed position. Uh, maybe you clenched or brushed your teeth, you regained controls of the muscles and the airway opened back up. Uh, myofunctional therapy has its place. Can it cure OSA? That's a big topic of debate right now. There's not a published study to date that it can you know, effectively manage it on its own. I do believe it's an adjunct, just like laser therapy for soft tissue, but I would be someone that would fail all of those therapies because my collapse happens at 19 centimeters. And there's no other way that I would have known that had I not measured it. Uh, the, the, oh, I just got it back. The, prime, the best explain, explanation, the visual picture that I've ever heard from another provider is a friend of mine, Dr. Tanner in Oregon. And he's talked about snoring as like a river. And he has a picture of a very calm river flowing. It's wide. The water looks like glass. And then that same river downstream becomes more narrow and there's rapids and there's people going through there in kayaks and they're having a blast, but that's turbulence. And so that redness that we see in the soft tissue is caused by this turbulence when the same amount of air volume or flow is trying to go past in a smaller space. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about Oregon, we've got to go to Nike and the founder of Nike says, if you're going to improve something, you've got to measure it. That's the drop the mic. I like that. That's your, that's your, <laughs> I like that. Do we have any other, while we have the room open here still, I think we have time for, you know, if there's any other questions, things we can show or talk about. Um, if not, I would, I would get to, um, the, what's the next steps for people? You know, we've talked a lot about implementation. We've talked a lot about, all right, don't be scared. You know, you're, you're already a sleep dentist, whether you want to be or not. Uh, let's, let's figure out how to capitalize on that and, and really make it a meaningful, significant part of your practice. And that's really, you know, what we're doing here at Sleep TV is just trying to spread the word and educate it. And we're going to hit a whole bunch of different topics throughout the year. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, our, our job at, at SGS is to help you make sleep uh, uh, something meaningful, not just a little onesie twosie. I made an appliance for my brother or myself or my dad or my neighbor, uh, but really a, a, a business, you know, and that's, that's really, you know, Jeff talked about that and what we need to do with this is treat it as a business. It's, it's part of your practice, meaning it, you can screen your dental patients, right? And you're going to identify those. Uh, but you know, this is a this is a, a dedicated business uh, for, you know, th that can run independent of your practice as well. And there's a lot of pieces to that that you need to to do this well. Uh, there's a medical insurance component. There's a procedural protocol, clinical and administrative component. There's instrumentation uh, for uh, like Jeff has been talking about for airway measurement and diagnostic testing. Um, you know that. One of the things, and sorry, off track, but uh, one of the things that I see people throw out there is, uh, oh, geez, I, I can't do that. Or I, I tried. I hear that a lot. I, I tried. I screened all my patients and I sent everybody to the sleep doctor. I told every single one of them, you got to go see sleep physician. You got to go see the sleep doctor. And I sent 200 people to the sleep doctor. And, and you know, what ends up happening is a majority don't go, right? The, the small percentage who do go get put on CPAP and you're left with little. Uh, so there's a better way to do this. And, and we certainly don't have time to get into that tonight. But there's a process here where it's going to keep the, the control of these cases more in your practice. You're still going to work with physicians, but you're going to do it in a collaborative way, not in a, hey, just go see the sleep physician and I'll never see you again. Way. Um, and you know, we'll talk about that in our courses and one of the last slides that, I don't know, Jeff or Jose or whoever put up uh, had that and had some of our upcoming events because that's what I would encourage you as a next step, right? As a next step to educate yourself and your team. You know, when Jeff was introducing us and he introduced Rebecca in particular, uh, you know, he said this, he, he said, 
you know, even though Rebecca is not a, 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 a dentist, she's run extremely successfully a, a couple of very, very, very large dental sleep practices. And I say run as in completely built it and, and did it herself um, because your, your team and, and uh, um, who will ultimately be your, your clinical sleep care coordinator is a critical role in the practice. So if you do decide to come to one of these events or one of our courses to really see the big picture and learn more, bring your team. You know, bring somebody who you're going to empower and you're going to you're going to try to put into that role because uh, this isn't a, you know, a, a doctor centric venture. This is really getting your whole team on board and just showing the boot camp stuff, because that's something that Rebecca does, uh, you know, with us. We, she started years ago as kind of a this is a client based program. So these are offices that we're already working with. Um, but bringing your your sleep coordinators together, uh, we do these events. I don't want to say quarterly, maybe. I brought uh, these up for for a reason. Number one yeah. is we've got some educators in here, and they need to understand what we do. Is we have a sleep program in a box. Like yeah. it is is no reason to reinvent the wheel. I was quoted in dental <laughs> economics like twenty years ago, but I wasn't talking about sleep at all but I hired the business coaches that I did because I knew nothing about running a business. And there's not a dentist that graduates dental school today that knows anything about running a sleep department, but you don't have to because Sorry. we're here, number one. Yeah. Number two, 90% <laughs> of this work can be done by someone that's competent as a sleep care coordinator. And that's what Rebecca does well. In fact, she just had one. So tell us about boot camp that you just had down in Florida. That we did. We had 25 uh, people attend the boot camp uh, last weekend in Florida, and in it was just fantastic. Just was an opportunity for dentists and their teams. Uh, I have a lot of dentists that attended as well to take uh, better communication in the team, to to have a better flow of the protocol, to polish their skills and polish their language and and overcome hurdles that we have. It was fantastic uh, weekend boot camp. We we came out of it really invigorated. We're going to have a lot of patients really get saved, and that's super cool. I, I'm really proud of that. That's the nicest thing. But, you know, when you work with Sleep Group Solutions, we <clears throat> so nice to have somebody actually hold your hand along the way. You know, if I had, you know, I didn't have really someone hold my hand when I first started doing this. It was still very, fairly young in the process, and I hit the ditch a few times, and, and it's really you know, something's my passion for you and your teams to, to share all of that with you guys so that I, you know, we, Dr. Harrison, John, uh, we could, and Michael Campbell, Layla Verdor, and all of us as educators and, and hand holders could really help you guys. So if you haven't ever been to a sleep group seminar, just, just what have you got to lose? It can only make your practice better. It can only help your patients. That's true. It can only help your community be, be healthier. It can only, you know, a rising tide raises all the boats. It, what do you got to lose other than just being able to see patients more clearly? And, and we're happy to help you along the way. We'll never let you alone in this. So uh, that's the, one of the things I'm most proud about working with Sleep Group for. Unless um, Jose, if you can pop up next week's registration, uh, anybody that's watching this, if this was valuable, I, if you could share it, we're always trying to get the word out. Many of the people that were on tonight that spoke, were talking about, we need to get this message out. I firmly believe that that's my why, um, don't have to do this. I choose to do this because it's the right thing. Um, I'm still here. I'm still breathing. So obviously. My time is not it. done yet. The next time we next time we have these, I invite all of you guys to to get back on and bring us some questions. Think, you know, put your thinking caps on between now and the next one. And and uh, if we have an opportunity to have an open forum like this, let's tackle some of those questions that you have. And you know, Jeff put his information up. Uh, mine is rlahey at sleepgroupsolutions.com. You're welcome to email me. Just let us know how we can help you guys. We want to help you be successful, help your patients be healthier. Yes, and on that, on that same on that same note, as Rebecca is saying, as and as Dr. Harrison, 
you know, and, and uh, John, John has discussed, you know, we, we value feedback, we value what you want to see. So, you know, if there's any topics that you want us to cover in another sleep TV, yeah. feel free to feel free to put that in the comments, feel free to message that to us. Um, next week, we will have um, Dr. Dan Taché. This is going to be a great, you know, uh, a great presentation on restless leg and sleep um, and some, you know, why people are CPAP or um, OAC intolerant. Um, he has uh, been thinking about this for a long time. He had some circumstances, so uh, that had to change it. But next week, we will have that um, here. So register. The, the link is in the chat as well. And the other um, aspect that, you know, we, we've already uh, done a little glimpse of during the presentation, um, but, you know, we've talked about the, the seminars that we have coming up. So we have um, a, lot of, a lot of seminars coming up in, in December. These are our two-day 16C seminars that John, uh, Rebecca, and Dr. Harrison have um, discussed about the value. So, you know, no need for me to revise that. Um, but what I can, you know, revise is to offer everybody that 50% off. So uh, the, if you go on online into our website to sleepgs.com, you go on seminars. And as you check out, you put in that code SLEEPTV in all caps, you will save 50% off uh, on your registration. And that'll allow you to bring one team member as well, including the doctor. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that everybody has a chance to think about that look up our dates. It's not just the ones that are showing up here. We have dates through 2022 um, in almost every city in the country. So, you know, wanted to make sure that everybody knows that. And I appreciate everybody that joined. And I thank you so much to Rebecca, Jeff, John, um, Mary Lou for your questions and your story. You know, it really, it really is um, great to start building up this community. Thanks everybody. Thank you, everybody. Everybody sleep safe. See you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks.